Okay. It's after show time. I got, I got it. That, that uh, Socrative worked pretty well or Socrative or whatever it's called. I, I looked on their website, literally looked on their website for a phone number, could not find one. I should probably just call their, I should probably do a, a, a lookup. Somebody, somebody who's smart and can Google things will probably find a number somewhere they can call because I just want to call during off hours. Whenever you find a company that has a weird name, I call it. And they go, thank you for calling Socrative. Then you know, well, it's nothing like what I thought it was. It was Socrative. Um, let's see. <laughs> That's one of those things. So it comes in handy sometimes uh, to be able to do something like that. You never get a live person anyway. It's always going to be some type of IVR that's that's spewing things back out you uh, to you. So that's one of those uh, things that was worth trying. I, I got tired of going to separate um, URLs every time somebody wanted to to participate. And I thought this was neat. It was no cost. There's no requirement on your side. So I thought that was good. Um, and uh, um, it, it just seemed to, to work a lot better on my side as well. I could just run through things. You didn't have to change. It just popped the new message back up, the new question back up, and off it went. That was kind of nice to have that there. Well, let's uh, go to the phone line. Some of you have been very patient and been waiting for, I don't know, an hour, 59 minutes, because because I don't know what that's about, but let's find out from the 571 area code. Are you there, caller? 59 minutes. Been on the phone listening. And it's just white noise. Oh, oh I heard I heard noise. Just as I put him on hold, I heard heard something else. Let's try the 571 area code again. Are you there, caller? Speak to me. I hear you. I hear somebody back there. Hi, what's your name? Very difficult to make out what you're saying there. Your your microphone is underwater. Maybe we can can figure it out. Let's give it a shot. Maybe not. It's one of the nice things about having a live setup like this, and there's nobody here helping, by the way. It's just me. Nobody's taking phone calls. So we're taking phone calls on our own and going through this. This may be a Skype caller because it's all ones. Let's see if you're there. Caller, are you there? And that's hello. Hello, caller. It's M A Graham. Hey, M A. How are you, sir? Oh, uh, we had a rough time of it uh, today. Uh, the live feed kept buffering all the time. Just uh, it's still going through the regular portion just to show where it is. You're just answering the question about multi-mode fiber. It's one of the benefits I have uh, about this, and you should you can probably fast forward even all the way through it too, because there's a, a DVR functionality that should allow you to fast forward all the way through. But it's all YouTube. I'm up to the. I, I throw it out to YouTube, and YouTube does what it does. And whether their their network works well or whether your network works well, it's all up to the the gods of networking to make all of these things work together. I'm afraid I don't have a lot of control over that, although I have been looking at other streaming providers that might even provide even more flexibility. So I apologize for the, the problems, but maybe I can get some of no, this tweaked yeah, yeah. soon. I'm I'm thinking it's more my end of it <laughs> because my ISP might be throttling a little bit. Uh, so what, we'll uh, see, I could but. I could talk another hour about net neutrality and ISPs and yeah. throttling, uh, especially from someone like me who uh, I'm just one guy trying to put videos out there. Um, that's it has it hits home very very careful very close to me for sure. Right. Anyway, Socrative went very, very well. I liked it, and I was able to keep up in the chat, so that's okay. Oh, good. Anyway, my my question for today is this. I It's a security question. Okay. I was moderating a discussion between a couple of groups, and I will stay neutral on the topic, but I'll want to get your thoughts on okay. it. Okay. Uh, there are people who... Uh, as far as Google and YouTube or those things are concerned, uh, they search it, they search YouTube, they search Google, but they never log in with their Google ID because they're afraid they might be tracked. Sure. And some of the people were saying, well, you're going to be tracked anyway. You're going to be tracked by your WAN IP. You're going to be tracked by your cookies and your, your <laughs> tracking cookies and all that. So it really doesn't matter. Uh, so I just I was just curious as to your thoughts on where you felt about that, whether or not 
it's worth it to log on and not care about it, or whether there's any benefit by doing the searches without logging on, or are they going to track him anyway? I'm, I go kind of, I have, I have kind of this, this both opinions, quite honestly. Uh, if somebody, because I'm logged into Google all the time, um, I have all of my YouTube, obviously uses my Google login. It's all my Professor Messer stuff. I use very strong passwords. At one time, I was even using Google's um, additional verification functionality. So I had multi-factor functions. So I had a username, password, and then a a pseudo-random number that Google would change. And I had an app on my phone and on my iPad just so I could keep those things separate because I knew that my entire browse history is stored in Google. Um, If there's a page you can go to in Google and view your entire archive, of everywhere you've been. Um, so if anybody wanted to know the deep, deep, dark recesses of my mind, that would be a great place to go, which means I don't want anybody seeing that. Um, you know, if, if you think bad about anybody, you'll think worse of them if you see their browser history. So that's that I'm always concerned about from, from that perspective. The part that I like, though, is that... Um, if I, I remember a year ago, I went to a website and it had something to do with this topic. And I really need to find that again. It's in my archive. Google's got it. I can go back and list through, look through it. And um, I just don't think that the the weird sites I go to um, that, are, that are not, you know, things people would normally think about Professor Messer's website and the videos and the odd stuff I'm going off to and the weird video transcript sites and I'm trying to buy equipment here and I'm trying to do streaming there and then the stuff I, you know, the Reddit, subreddits I go to. Okay, who really cares from my perspective? If you see that, I guess that's fine. But the other part of me says there's, there is a security piece associated with this. If you're logged into Facebook, Facebook is also watching where you go. That information is fed back to exactly. Facebook and the Facebook cookies. So where does it stop? Every com- every com- company is trying to collect this information because our eyeballs are very valuable on the internet. Um, so I don't disagree with the folks that said, I'm not going to log into Google. I'm going to use an anonymizer like Tor or many of the other VPN anonymizers that are out there. And I'm not going to do anything that 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 is um, tied back to me. Now, here's, here's an interesting thing, though, because I was just finishing up my security plus i'm updating the security plus videos and it's interesting that a number of years ago uh aol uh aol labs had a ton of browsing information that they wanted to make available i mean millions and millions and millions of search uh search suggestions not browsing information but searches that were done on aol what they did was take all the searches but they anonymized the names and ip addresses of where the searches came from and they replaced that with just a number so if you're number seven, everything you search for in that list on AOL showed up with the number seven next to it. And they handed this right. list off to researchers. And the researchers actually, I think it was the Washington Post or New York Times, one of these big newspapers was able to look at a certain set of searches done by a particular number, narrowed it down to a person, went to her house and said, is this you? And she said, yeah. Yeah. So in that particular right. case, she was completely anonymized by that, in case you might even want to say the IP address, and they were still able to find the actual person associated with it. So that's why I go both ways on this. Like, I could try to be anonymous, but at the end of the day, if the NSA wanted to really track what you were doing, they're simply tapping the line anyway. You've got an IP address. The IP address is tied back to you. They're collecting it right now. Uh, at least we know that piece of it. So... Um, I guess it depends how private you want to be and from who to decide whether you want to log in or not. But that's that's my sort yeah, of my yeah, ten minutes. I, I don't I don't think the uh, concern was about the NSA because the NSA is going to do what they're going to do anyway. I think it was more about the marketing firms trying to uh, determine who you are just by when I see collections and you know anonymize things anyway. So, it's a uh, it's a double edged sword. I could not do what I do here if there was not advertising on the internet. The advertising when you go to the Professor Messer website is customized for your browsing history. It's what Google provides. So if you're someone who is very interested in the weather, you're going to get ads associated with weather systems and and uh, the the weather type uh, of things that you could purchase. If you're interested in fishing, it's going to be all ads about fishing. By anonymizing yourself, you go around the website and you just get generic ads. And in a way, 
that, that doesn't help you. It really doesn't help me very much. But I guess if, if that's the only negative, I guess you're okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, always a pleasure to do your uh, reviews and all. And, I, again, I like the soccer tip, and I, I, for one, was one of those people that asked you to put in the I already passed uh -huh. the damn question. It was so you. I think I, I appreciate that. So, I don't... anyway, uh, thanks again. I look forward uh, to your network when next, and I'll keep listening. Take care. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Bye now. That's a... Uh... I knew it was somebody here that kept showing up and said, would you please put that in? Actually, very valuable for me to put that in. Why did I not do it sooner? Uh, the 937 area code, are you there, caller? Let's go now to 301 area code. Are you there, caller? Hello? Hello, caller. What's your name? Hi, my name is Stacy. Hello, Stacy. I'm doing great. How are you today? And what can we do for you? I have a question. Um, I am working on the 801 um, section, and um, I know there are going to be a lot of, I guess, uh, simulations on there. Um, I was just wondering if you can go over how to, um, I guess, uh, build a uh, gaming PC as opposed to like a like a home theater PC or a ThickNet uh, PC. I guess I'm just trying to figure out which piece would be best. Like, I know a gaming PC needs more power as opposed to a, um, I guess, a, like a home theater PC in some cases. But I guess I'm still struggling on how to recognize those specific pieces There's a, this is each. Sure. This, and the 801 is interesting. I know we always talk about these questions that you get on the exam as simulation questions. Um, for the 801, there's really not a simulation to be had because in the 801, you haven't actually gotten to the operating system part. And if you look through the 801 exam objectives, there's no command line stuff on the 801 exam. So it's not really simulation. I, it really is the performance-based questions, which are really just telling you it could be matching. It could be fill in the blanks. Um, it could be you've got a list of different computer types and you're matching up different characteristics to those computer types. There's a lot of different options available. And in the 801, it was actually a new section in the PC hardware section that talked about all of these different um, different configurations for your computer because you can you can build a computer and do a lot of different things with it. And I think the options, if I find, let me see if I can find the, the different... Um, the different um, computer methods, different computer types that are here with the different components is where you really do get into things like gaming computers, um, working with, uh, I think there's, uh, off the top of my head, there's a CAD CAM type manufacturing computers. There is um, the media systems, which are incredibly, um, incredibly popular these days to be able to do those. Uh, and there's an entire section for designing custom computer systems that goes through all of these different computer types. Um, it is section 1.9 of the 22801, and it goes through um, all of those pieces. Um, I have a video that goes through graphics workstations and what the different options are for the graphics workstation and working with that. And what I did was try to put in what the most important components were for each one of these systems. So a graphics system needs a lot of video and it probably needs a lot of CPU. If you're getting to a video editing station, then you're going to need um, a lot of CPU power. You're gonna need um, a lot of, of memory to be able to work with this and a really fast drive. I couldn't use a, a video editing system if I didn't have an SSD. Uh, you have to go through virtualization systems and understand what a virtualization system needs because virtualization, that needs an incredible amount of resources in there. Lots of memory, lots of CPU. It's going to be running at, at very high utilizations all the time. Uh, gaming systems are very similar to that, probably not the extent of storage and memory, but certainly a higher amount than what you get on a traditional personal computer. And you got home theater machines that have completely unique video. So what I tried to do in this video was go through kind of what the highlights are for each one of those things, including standard desktops and thin desktops, thin clients and home servers, so that you get an idea of where the high points are. And I think it's really a matter, a lot like with all of these performance-based questions, it's really a matter of taking what they have given you and turning it into 
an answer that is not the traditional multiple choice. But I think if you know it's kind of the high highlights in the of each one of those systems. You should be able to narrow down something like that, even if it was presented to you in a performance based question. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you so much. Good luck with that. I don't for everybody who's taking performance based questions. Don't let them throw you. In fact, many people have said in the chat room, and you may want to consider this as well, Stacy, is that they are generally mm -hmm. at the first part of the exam, and if it, it, some of these can take a lot of time to go through. Uh, you may have many, many of these questions to go through. A lot of people are skipping them because on the A-plus exam, you can go all the way to the end. You can go to the beginning. You can go to any question you want at any time. Many people are skipping them and going right to the multiple choice because those tend to be the bulk of the exam, and they go through all the way the multiple choice questions. Then at the end, they circle back to the performance based, and what they're finding is that some of the multiple choice questions are jogging their memory on their performance-based questions. That might be a strategy you might want to try when you finally go take the exam that might help you a little bit get a few, at least a few extra points in the exam. I see. Thank you so much. I will definitely do that. Good luck with that. Let us know how it goes. Oh, I sure will. Thank you so much for all you do. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. There's, uh, there's a lot with performance-based questions. I think we worry about them too much. I think if we just sat down and went into the questions, it turns out to be sort of the normal type of question we might be accustomed to, to seeing. Uh, let's see, uh, we've got another caller on the line. Are you there, caller? It's very quiet for this caller. You will hear a beep on the line whenever I, I go to that call. We're going to put that caller back on mute. I think I have the 908 area code that just called. Are you there, caller? Yes, I am. Can yes, you, you are. Hi, what's your name? My name is Kevin. How you doing? Hey, Kevin. Thanks for calling. What can we do for you today? As someone who's new to the IT field, it's pretty much a, a career change for me. What is the likelihood of me getting a job with the, uh, the foundational courses uh, such as the 801 and the 802? Like, I noticed when I, you know, when I uh, research what employers are looking for, they generally require a lot of experience. Now, as someone who's, pretty, like, like I said, pretty much new to the IT field, what would be the likelihood of me getting a job right away? I wish there was a straightforward answer to, <laughs> to this particular question. It is a remarkably common question, though, um, because, and quite honestly, there's no specific answer for this particular question. But I can give you some, uh, at least, perspective as to what the A plus certification provides and how people at least look at it. Um, whenever you, and I recommend anybody who's looking for a job in it, go out to the big sites, go out to the monsters.com monster.com <laughs> monsters. I don't even know what monsters is. Go to dice.com, go to careerbuilder.com, go to the sites that have the job postings on them and go look at the jobs that are the entry level it jobs. We all, it seems, start in the help desk. I started in the corporate world in the help desk. Um, and, and we all sort of begin at the point where we're helping people solve problems with their computers in these large environments. Go look at help desk entry-level positions and see what they're asking for. And I'll tell you, you see a huge range of what people are asking for. Um, generally, they will ask for, and I'll tell you, don't be thrown by this too much. They'll generally ask for a formal degree of some kind, a, a two-year degree, a four-year degree. They're going to ask for a degree of some kind. They're going to ask for experience of some kind. And they might ask for a certification or they might not. It really is more of a philosophical question for many organizations. But let's say that they, these three things are there. Now, for somebody who doesn't have any experience in IT, you don't have a formal degree in IT. I, I, I don't have a formal degree in IT. Mine's in business. So don't be thrown by those things. The employers would love to be able to find somebody who had the degree. They would love to be able to find somebody who has experience at a help desk. But quite honestly, the, the entry-level positions, I think those in many cases are at least optional. And it, it really depends on how you do in the interview. And it depends a lot on who you know. Um, this is the place where you go outside the scope of your formal training and now you're you're having to communicate more on a personal level, at a human level. And it helps if you've done a lot of socializing in the IT industry. If you're not part of a local group, uh, go to the meetup 
Security.com. Uh, look for IT organizations uh, like uh, for security. There's ISSA. There's Microsoft user groups. There's a lot of places where people will go from the companies around and we'll meet once a month and talk about the challenges that they have. They'll bring in guest speakers. There's often pizza involved, which means I'm there. So there's a great place to meet people so that when you finally go to an interview, you go, oh, yeah, I, I was here. I spoke with this person at the Microsoft user group who works here, and he was telling me about what you do with this. Those things help you amazingly at the interview get around some of the shortcomings you might have with a formal degree or with uh, certifications uh, or with experience. But I think the best possible scenario is to have all of these, but the reality is not everybody has those. Um, it really also depends on the employer. Uh, and you'll see this whenever you start looking at, do I really need to go get my certification? One group of people says, nobody cares about these certifications. Employers don't even look at them. They're not useful at all. The other side, people say, I have an employer, they require that I have an A plus before I even start on the help desk. So it, it's really going to depend on the employer's philosophy too. Maybe they want to get somebody who has no experience and no certifications because they can pay them less, just a little bit, but they're going to pay you less and they'll put you on the help desk and they'll train you. They know that you're going to need to be trained and they'll train you and get you going along those lines. Uh, other companies are looking for seasoned professionals and maybe you don't have a shot with them. It's really a question you have to feel out based on what you know of the company, who works there, what they put into their job posting. And sometimes you just have to go in an interview and say, what are you guys looking for? Do you, do you need somebody who's willing to learn that can jump into this, that's really excited about the technology? Are you looking for experience? Because you look at my resume, I have no experience on there. What, is, what do you think about that, Mr. Employer? And just level with them um, and see what they have to tell you. That ultimately is going to be the answer because it's going to come down to one or two people you work with during that interview process. I know that's a, a, a sort of a non-answer, isn't it, Kevin? <laughs> sort of. But sort of. I get where you're going. I get where you're going with it. Well, it, it's it's always a challenge. The certification part and getting the the knowledge that you need is only half the battle. It is really getting your foot in the door, knowing people that are there, having somebody vouch for you. Uh, I will say, at many organizations, there is a uh, referral program. So if you are at one of these Microsoft user groups and you meet someone there who, and they usually at the user group have a section of the user group where you're socializing before or after, and you meet somebody who works in an organization you'd like to work at, ask them, hey, do you guys have a referral program? Because I'm interested in putting in a, a resume with you guys. Can I, can I give it to you and you can put my name in? Because if they hire you, the person who referred you gets, you know, 500 bucks, they get a thousand dollars. They're very motivated to send your resume in with their name on it with HR. That might give you a little bit of a leg up too. So there's, there's other ways to work around those pieces um, and sort of diminish the things that might be negatively viewed and certainly enhance the things that you absolutely have on your resume. Okay. All right. Thank you, Professor. Good luck with that, Kevin. There's um uh, I, I really should do some videos of the interview process. We used to do those in the study group. We used to go through a a, a, um, a recruiting type section. It would be nice to do that before. Before we go back to the uh, the phones, let me check the um, check the chat room. I think we're good there. Everybody's fine on the study group side. I've got um, got a few more minutes here. We've got some other calls, so let's go to the. I've got another one from, uh, let's try this this caller here. Are you there, caller? Don't hear a hello there. So we'll try the next one down the line. Are you there, caller? The white noise. Oh, I think I do hear you back there. What's your name? Oh, my name is Garrett Schumacher. Hello, Garrett. I think you've called before, haven't you? Yes, I have. How are you, sir? Yeah, I frequently do. All right. I just have a simple question this month. Oh, I, some, I just want to become a better ty touch typer. I didn't know if there's like any websites oh. out there to become a better typer. This is this is a good question, and it's one that has completely stumped me um, because I don't do a lot of, of typing piece. Um, there was, um, and, and I'm, I'll put this out to the chat room, so everybody's watching along those lines. If there is a site you go to where touch typing is useful, I did one. This is one of those cases where having my Google um, archive might help. 
Uh, but there's tons of games you can find on the internet that can kind of help you with with typing and touch typing. But I don't do many of them because I've just I type all the time, so I don't even think about it anymore. Um, so I'll bet the chat room will come up with some some options for us. I will tell you that when I started typing, um, <clears throat> was back in high school. We had IBM Selectrix with the big uniball, the ball at the front. You type on the electric typewriter. Um, and, and you learn kind of the home keys and how to properly type. And, and I, I've kind of forgotten since then that that became a very valuable skill, at least early on with computing, because you could learn to type faster and faster and faster. And I went to work at a, a university computing center and the guys who ran the mainframes there, boy, they could type. I'd never seen anybody type so fast in my life on a computer keyboard. And it, it kind of made me realize that I could make this thing go faster as well. Um, and back then it was like Mavis Beacon teaches typing back in those days. I don't know what people use anymore, but I remember using a, uh, a flash game that, you know, the letters would drop from the sky and you had to type the letter and it would, it would, it would pummel the, the particular letters there. And there was another one I was using that would give you your speed in uh, words per minute, which is how you measure the typing. Um, and somebody else in the chat room said, Oh yeah, Mavis Beacon. Yeah. I, I've done that one before. Absolutely. Um, I just don't know any, but any offhand I'm, I'm stymied on that one. It's not one I've run into before, uh, but I'll keep watching the chat room, um, and see if they have any options available. And if they do, I'll stick them in the, in the notes that I put under the replay and say, here's a, here's a couple of typing spots that other people have liked. And if somebody's watching the replay, go to the professor Messer website, at the top of the page, hit the contact us button, which is really contact me. And, uh, I'll add it to the list as well. Be nice to know that type racer is another one folks have said in the chat room. So there's a, there's another option type that racer. might give you type racer and, it, uh, and no folks and in schools around, uh, people are saying type to learn with the two as the number two type to learn. And, uh, there's some other typing courses and links. Um, here are touch typing. Jordan chat room says keybr.com. So I don't even know if these are legitimate or not. I may have to do editing afterwards because he may be sending us to just, uh, who knows where that sounds like a legitimate site to me though. And it looks like a legitimate site. Keybr.com. K E Y B R. There you go. Other people say type racer. I think those are some good options for us. We could try those and see if that, uh, see if that works for you. I think, I think knowing how to type and type fast is incredibly useful. If you're going to be doing networking, operating system work, especially in windows and Linux, you're going to be doing a lot of the command line. The faster you can type, the better off you're going to be. And it is refreshing because I work with a lot of networking professionals. We're doing reconfigurations of routers and firewalls. It's refreshing when you sit down with somebody and you say, we really need to configure NAT. They go, okay, NAT's done. Like, Fantastic. Let's go to the next thing. It's amazing how much that uh, speeds things up. I think that's a good, um, I think that's a good set of skills to be able to learn. Absolutely. Yes. Are these sites also free or free of charge or do you have to pay a fee to use them? I popped around to a few of those. They stuck in the chat room and they looked uh, absolutely free. So that was kind of nice. They're probably some of them. I did see ads that were wrapped around them. So I think uh, you've got a good set of selections to choose from. Okay. Sounds great. Well, thanks, Garrett. Good luck with that. And if you do find a good one and you like it, let us know what uh, you finally settled on. Okay. Will do. Thank you, sir. Take care. Yes, you too. All right, we're gonna one more time go up to the uh, the hissing number. There, are you there, caller? Say your name. Say your name. Say your name. Nope, I think that's that's going to finish out our calls for the week. I know keyboard shortcuts. I'm a I'm a I'm fastidious with learning keyboard shortcuts, so I never have to go to the mouse. Just constantly type, 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 type. My do my. Command S, save, and I'm good. Don't have to go up to that bar and move my mouse around to do those things. Those shortcuts are really fantastic. And there's a number of, of uh, utilities that can really help with shortcuts, uh, both in Windows and Mac. Uh, let me see if I can find the one that I'm thinking of. I may not be able to find it. Whenever I'm trying to find an application that I don't remember what it is, I go to Ninite. Have you ever seen Ninite? Ninite's the best. Uh, N-I-N-I-T-E dot com. Um, you can pick a bunch of programs. Here's a big list of them. You just check the ones that you would like to have installed. I'm just going to randomly check. I really don't want to install these. These are, these are for Windows. If you're running a Windows machine, this is it. And you click one button and it installs them all at once. It's amazing. It's fantastic. 
Um, and if you're trying to remember, what was that tool I used to do this thing? They probably have it on here and already categorized. So you can see things like utilities, document readers, imaging, online storage. It's all there. Or if you're just trying to find a program that you've never used before, all the programs are here. I've been using it for years and years and years and years. It's absolutely legitimate. It is, um, there's, there's nothing squirrely about this. They're not going to install any malware onto your computer. It's fantastic in how it works. There's some other sites like this out there, um, but Ninite seems to be the one I always go to, um, to, to find those things. Really, really useful um, if you're just trying to find that program. There's other Mac versions of this. There's Linux versions. It's not called Ninite. There's other versions there. They finally do have other options at the top of Ninite. Here's one for Linux, for instance, for Ubuntu. Um, you can download some of the Linux utilities. Certainly not as many there. That'd be nice to have as well. A bunch of Linux stuff. It's hard enough to find the apps you need in any operating system. Uh, Ninite's a good one to use there. Well, that should bring us to the end of our monthly study group in the after show. I want to thank everybody for trying out the new uh, beta of our question and answer session. Um, and there's uh, I was never quite sure if that was going to do exactly what we did, but sure enough, it seem to work out. Uh, thanks for everybody for joining us. Thanks for all your questions throughout the month. Thanks for calling in. Just really fantastic that we're able to, to work with those and probably do those things. There is so much more to do along these lines next month or next week at 12 noon on Saturday is our Network Plus study group for the month. You're welcome to join us for that as well. We'll do the same thing. We'll go through the Socrative.com and step through all, I've got a bunch of questions we'll put up for that one as well. I've got many other questions that I couldn't get to all of them this month, but we'll certainly get to many of them next month. And we'll do whatever we can to, to keep you updated with everything you know to pass your A-plus exam. So until next time, we'll see you on the Network Plus or the A-plus study group. Remember, keep those questions coming. Thanks everyone for joining us. See you next time.